Good morning and welcome to Reach Online. We are one church in many places and we are thrilled to have you with us today. My name is George and this is my wife Esther and this is our baby. So this morning uh, we have once again got an exciting meeting planned for you. We will be worshipping with Ben from Derby followed by a testimony from Jace in Nottingham and then Sean is going to bring us the word. But before we start George why don't you just um, pray with us. Yeah, Lord, thank you that we have this opportunity to come together this morning. And I just pray that as we worship from our homes, that your spirit will just rest uh, where we are, Lord, and just do work in us this morning. Be with us and just bless us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder Consider all the works thy hand hath made I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest gates I walk, Sweetly in the trees When I look down From lofty mountain grandeur And see the brook And hear the gentle breeze Oh, then sings my soul My Saviour God to me How great Thou Savior God to thee, how 
Lord, we welcome you. We say you are great. Lord, I'm reminded that we are standing in with millions, thousands, however many others, God, worshipping you, worshipping the true God. And we want to lift you high this morning. We want to set our eyes on you. We want to focus on what you have to say, what you want to do in our lives. We ask, would you come? Would you be with us? Would you speak to us? Would you move us, God? Would you take us from where we are further into where you want us to be? Come, Lord Jesus. So, this next one has got some actions. I'm hoping there'll be somewhere on the screen, someone to follow. We'll see what happens. We're going to sing my life. My wrestling in my life. In my face. Great love will lead me through. You are the means of Oh, you are the means
song you could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever pray. We live for you. Oh, we live for you.
inside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. So I've come actually into uh, Emmanuel School to record this evening, um, mostly because it was very loud and there's lots of children in my house. Um, I do work here, don't worry, I've not just broken in. But I've been reminded this week in our assembly theme about Psalm 103. We're focusing on Psalm 103 and it is a reminder of how amazing God is, how good he is to us and a call for us to praise him and I'm reminded as I stand in this building actually the years and years of God's goodness that have been present here in good times and hard times and interesting times as well but he has always been good to this building and actually he's good to us all the time everywhere and as we sing this song I just want to remind you of that as you are at home praising, as you are at home worshipping, as you are at home hopefully being ministered to by the Holy Spirit. But he is good. He is completely good. There is nothing in him that is not good and all of his intentions towards you are good. And as we come to him this morning and lay ourselves at his feet, let's remind ourselves of his goodness and let's praise him, even when it's hard sometimes. Even when there's difficulty, we can praise. We can say, I praise the Lord for what he has done and what he will do. Your voice, you have 
This picture is simply an invitation, an invitation to step in to deeper relationship with God. I don't know what's through the archway for you. It might be rest or peace or companionship or conversation or reassurance, but I do know that it is relationship with the God who created you. So today, this is your invitation. Step in. Yes, Father, we thank you that you are a good God and that your goodness is with us from the time that we wake up in the morning to the time that we lay down our heads at night and I just pray that it would be really tangible to us today and in the coming week. Amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Ben, for leading us there. That was really good. We're going to go straight across now to Holly, our kids worker, and we're going to find out what some of the kids have been up to this week. And I think there might even be some of the artwork that the kids have produced this week. Over to you, Holly. Hey Reach Kids, my name is Holly and I'm the children's worker at our Reach Derby Hub. 
I'm popping on to let you know that new videos have gone live over on our YouTube channel. But I'm also here to show you some amazing pictures and videos that we've been sent in from you guys. So, are you ready to see if you can spot yourself? Roll video now. your pictures and your videos and hear how you guys are doing and it's not too late if you still want to do that we want to keep seeing all of the amazing things that you're getting up to whilst we're at home i also have an extra special request we're going to be doing a song soon called our god is a great big god it's a song with actions, so I'm very excited to sing it. But I was wondering if you guys would send in drawings or pictures or collages or paintings of the things that are in that song. So things like the sea and the mountains and the skyscrapers. We need your help as well, adults, because that song's very long. So we're going to need lots and lots of pictures, okay? Send those along to my email address and we'll do something funky where we match the song with the images and it's gonna look really cool. Okay, that's enough from me. Let's go back to the meeting leaders. Bye. Thanks, Holly, that's really fantastic. It's great to see what the kids have been getting up to. Um, and I mean, Esther and I really love the children's broadcast and everything that you're doing. We think it's brilliant. And I know feedback from everyone else is exactly the same. So Definitely. really, really well done. Yeah. Um, so in order for work like this to continue, um, we really encourage you to keep giving. We've been so blessed over this period of especially the last three months during lockdown with people's generosity. Mm. Um, and if you, if you feel in your heart that God is prompting you to give, go on our website, um, just click the button and it's a really easy process. Thank you. We're now going to hear a testimony from one of our friends in Nottingham, uh, Jace. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to hand straight over to him. He's got a really moving story um, and about the power of community and how it's really changed his life. So over to you, Jace. Hi, my name is Jace. I live in Nottingham and I'm part of Reach Church. Um, not done this before, so you have to bear with me. Just want to do a little testimony to explain what God's done for me, especially recently. Found God again in the last year or so. Uh, got baptised a few months ago now. And since, since being baptised, I've had huge differences in my life. I've had things come together which I never thought would be fixed. Relationships mended um, with my family, which I never thought that would happen. Like 15 years of trials and um, of struggling to try and make things work. Nothing ever worked and now all of a sudden things are just falling into place. I have friendships which, which I can't live without now. People that genuinely love and care for me for the first time in my life. I've got that through my church community. People that genuinely care and genuinely love and that's amazing. I've had some real struggles over the last month or so. I've had some huge attacks from the enemy which have brought me to the point where I've wanted to die got so bad a little over a week ago I tried to kill myself my friend Carl came over on the Friday after and talked to me and prayed with me and literally almost instantly as he prayed with me I felt God come into me like nothing I've ever felt in my life it, this warm safe I, I can't it's difficult to explain it's it just amazing feeling of not being alone and and having so much support through him and since then like i know it's only been a short time but i've gone from strength to strength i've gone from being absolutely crushed under the weight of my anxiety and and depression to now a week later feeling full of love full of life wanting to focus my life on helping others and doing everything I can to, to to just be a better person and to make 
things right and I feel like I know how to and I feel like all that's been missing from my life has always been God. Every time things have been bad in my life, it's been when I've walked away from, from God. I grew up in the church and I moved away from the church when I was about 14. And at 15 years old, my life fell to pieces. I was out, out homeless on the streets and things didn't get better until about a year or so ago when I found the, um, when I started going to the big table missional community. So I just wanted to share that with people and just let you know that, you know, if you're feeling like you're alone, you're not. He's there. You may not see him working. You may not feel it at that point in time, but he's there. You've just got to open your heart and let him in. Try and live your life in the best way possible. Be good to one another and just ask for God to come into you and he will listen. I've done some terrible things in my life that I'm really not proud of. And if he can save me, then he can do it for anyone. So stay strong and stay, keep with your faith and trust in God because he won't let you down. Wow, thanks, Jace. Really appreciate that, man. Um, just honesty and sharing what God's been doing in your life. Uh, that's brilliant. If anyone else feels like they've got something to share, um, you can always contact us at testimonies at reachonline.org. Uh, we love to hear stories about what God's doing. So, yeah. Please do get in touch. Yeah. And I think what we've really, uh, what you will have heard through Jason's testimony is that none of that could have happened if it hadn't been for missional communities. And that's very much the driving force of our church. So if you're not currently connected to a community, then again, there's an email address below um, to contact us and find out more about connecting mm. in with communities. Or if you just want to um, speak to someone at the church about what this is all about, again, email us at hello at reachonline.org yeah. um, and you can find out more. Yeah, we're now at the point where we're going to hand over to Sean Dooley. Um, we love Sean. We think he's brilliant. And we just want to hand over to him now as he brings the word to us, living with an eschatological monocle. And if you don't know what that is, well, it's a good thing you're watching this morning because you will find out. Hi. I'm Sean Dooley. I'm married to Nola Dooley. We've got 24 children and uh, one grandchild. So we have three biological children and grandchild and 21 foster children. Uh, we're from Reach Derby. The title of my talk today is called Living with an Eschatological Monocle. Have you ever noticed that some believers seem to suffer. Have you ever known a Christian that's been through a fiery trial? Have you maybe been through a fiery trial and asked yourself the question, why me? Nola and I sometimes reflect on our 20 years in the UK and we often reflect on it as being the toughest time that we have ever lived through in our lives. Um, we faced some of the most excruciating times during those 20 years, and, and that's happened a number of times. And those times have flushed out of us some of our nastiest and darkest core beliefs and behaviors. We moved to Derby just under 12 weeks ago, and we moved straight into lockdown and into furlough with all the kind of uncertainty that that brings. Um, and during these last few weeks, I've managed to have a crash on my bike where I broke my nose and suffered the effects of concussion for another two weeks. Nola has had surgery on her nose so we're doing the nose thing but nola's had surgery on her nose to cut out a um, a lump of skin cancer and she's started a new job as a personal assistant for a mum that's losing her sight i'm not trying to garner sympathy by telling you these things i'm i'm just trying to illustrate that this is a very live issue for us, this thing of suffering as believers. I think we're all pretty clear that all believers will at some point go through a time of fiery trial. 
And the, the follow-on question to that is how or what attitude does God woo us to have during those fiery trials and um, what kind of behavior in our lives actually makes his heart glow? Well, I think that's why Peter wrote his uh, first little letter uh, from Rome to believers in what's now modern day Turkey. And they were going through some really tough times. Uh, church history tells us that Peter himself came to be crucified outside Rome, upside down. Um, and I tell you what, I'm so glad that us Christians in the West just get to live all the health and wealth and prosperity and comfort. Oh, anyway, back to Peter in his short letter. He, he wanted to answer the question, what attitude does God woo us to have during fiery trials? And what kind of behavior in our lives makes his heart glow? And so I'm going to ask you to have a Bible open while I talk and, um, I'm, and, and just follow along as, as I speak. Uh, I'd, I'd like us to read together and we're going to begin 1 Peter chapter 4 verse 1 and I literally want us to read together. I'd love you to actually read out loud as I read. Um, I'm reading from the NRV but read what, whatever version you have but let's read it together and uh, I can't hear you. You can hear me uh, so we're good. Uh, I'm going to read from verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 4. So if you're ready let's go. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. Peter references suffering quite a bit in this chapter. He's mentioned here that Christ suffered in his body, and he seems to think that suffering will definitely come to Christians whilst they're living in these earthly bodies. In fact, if you just glance down at verse 4, he says, we'll have abuse heaped on us. Verse 12, we'll suffer fiery trials. Verse 13, we'll participate in the sufferings of Christ. Verse 14 and 16, he says, we'll be insulted and suffer because we're Christians. And then finally in verse 19, he says, some of us will suffer according to God's will. How on earth does the message of health and wealth and prosperity and comfort gel with that? I sometimes wonder whether the comfort of the Western church isn't one of Lucifer's greatest achievements, giving us the splendor of the nations if we'll just not serve the kingdom of God with all our hearts. Just as long as we won't go, as long as we won't speak out for Jesus, as long as we won't start new communities, as long as we won't go and plant new churches wherever King Jesus wants us to, as long as we won't do that, he will give us an easy life of comfort and prosperity and health and wealth uh, as long as we won't um, live fully for Jesus. Sorry, end of my rant. To our surprise, Peter encourages us to arm ourselves with this attitude. He literally means, the, 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 the word in Greek, it literally means to pick up a weapon and to, and he's saying, when we're willing to suffer well for God, it's as if we pick up a weapon that we can wield against the enemy of our souls. I remember when we first came to uh, Reading in the UK, we were newly there. Um, this had never happened. The police told us it hadn't happened in his memory in our close, but it happened twice within a few days. Somebody tried to break into our home. On the one occasion I was in the bath, somebody tried to break into our home. Nola and the kids were shouting. I leapt out the bath, grabbed the towel around me, picked up an African knob carry, which is like a stick with a big thing on the top. And I went running out the front of the house and down the road with my, with my knob carry and little else. And uh, I had picked up a weapon to take on my enemy. And 
And Paul's saying, when, when we decide in our hearts, I don't care if I have to suffer, I'm living full on for Jesus. It's like picking up a weapon that you can use against the enemy. So Peter goes on in verse 2, if you'll read with me in verse 2. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. It seems as if Peter is saying, if we suffer because we're Christians, sin loses its hold on us. Now, my immediate response to that was, why would sin lose its hold on me just because I suffer? I thought about that, and I, I think it's because deep down we've settled that we're, we're following Jesus no matter what. And we've decided that we're not following the God of this world anymore, though it cost us because we've made that decision. And it will inevitably cost us because when we make that decision and we turn our back on the God of this world, we suddenly become a, a focus of his attention and an object of his focus. And we will suffer. It will happen to us. Now, when we've made that decision and settled it in our hearts, we're done with sin. It, it may happen that we occasionally slip up, but that is the exception and not the rule in our lives. We simply confess, repent and move on. We've decided that the rest of our earthly lives are for the will of God. So that's why we sing that song. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back, no turning back. Now, if you've decided that you're done with the God of this world and that you've settled it in your heart, that you're following Jesus no matter what, I really want to ask you to raise your hand. Awesome. I see all those raised Christian hands. Bless you. You might have noticed that verse 2 has already introduced us to the first thing Peter says about how God woos us to live when we're going through difficult times. And so in me trying to lay out uh, what I believe Peter's answer is to the question of what does God uh, woo us to, um, uh, the attitude he woos us to have and what behavior makes his heart glow. Uh, my point one is in verse two that we live the rest of our earthly lives for the will of God. When Peter says, for the rest of our earthly lives, he's pointing to the fact that we only get one go at this life. In Hebrews chapter 9, it says, it's appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. We get one go at this life. Let's leave it all on the field. Of this life. Okay, let's read on in verse 3. For, though, for, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Now, we might say to ourselves, well, I might have got a bit tipsy once, and I know I've experienced a bit of lust. Uh, but I've never been a part of debauchery or an orgy or carousing, whatever that is, but it sounds pretty bad. And I've certainly not been a part of detestable idolatry. Um, not so fast. Some of the original Greek words are not that easy to translate into English. And if you've read other versions of the Bible, you'll notice it uses different words to translate the, the, the original Greek words in that place. So the first word debauchery just comes from the negative of exercising self-restraint. Have you ever not exercised self-restraint? The word lust comes from a deep longing for something, especially something that is illicit. The word drunkenness is, the Greek word literally means an excess of wine. Orgy comes from the word komos, which means letting go. Now it can mean what we think of that word orgy, but it just means letting go. And carousing comes from the word potos, which simply means a, a bout of drinking. And detestable idolatry, 
Idolatry is when we make something other than God more important than God in our lives. And I have to confess that even as a Christian, I've done that and had to repent. So these are the things that God will judge. And they're the things that Jesus died to forgive us for. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me and like you. I'm infinitely grateful that I don't get what I deserve. Let's read on in verse 4. They're surprised that you don't join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. But they'll have to give account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Alongside the idea that we've got one life to live, there's a very strong theme of the end times and judgment in this chapter of Peter's letter. Theologians call this eschatology, and that comes from the Greek word eschaton, which just means the end times. So eschatology is us trying to study what the Bible tells us about the end times. I believe that Peter wants us to have one eye on the fact that there is an end coming. And he starts the next verse, verse 7, saying the end of all things is near. And he also closes the chapter by talking about judgment and the end times again. Thank goodness that Peter never mentions the judgment or the, the end times coming without in the same breath mentioning the gospel. So read with me in, in the, the second half of verse 5. It says, But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to the human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in to God in regard to the spirit. Peter is saying that we get through the judgment only because of the gospel. The good news that Jesus died on the cross in our place, taking on himself all the punishment that you and I deserve for the things that we have done, the wrong things we've done in this body and the things we will still do in this body. So that those who believe in him receive his righteousness and we receive the power of the Holy Spirit to live this life now for him. He mentions judgment and the gospel in the same breath again at the end of the chapter, as I mentioned. Well, that concludes point one. Don't have a heart attack. It goes really quickly now. But point one is the main thing is that we get one life to live and that we need to leave it all on the field and that there is an end coming and there is a judgment coming and we get through it because of the gospel alone. But that gospel woos our hearts to live 100% for God. So going on from the theme of justice, Peter now addresses those who've responded to the gospel and are living according to the Spirit. These are my next points in trying to lay out what Peter's answer would be to the question of what attitude does God woo us to have in difficult times and what behavior in our lives makes his heart glow. So my first point was that we live the rest of our earthly lives for God's will. Peter now goes on and he says in verse 7, you can read with me. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, verse 7, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. That's my point two. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. That's my point three. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's my point four. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. That's my point five. 
Now to Peter's concluding remarks. Dear friends, don't be surprised. Oh, read with me verse 12. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly sinner? And so those who suffer according to God's will should. And so here come my final two points. If you read with me um, in verse 19, they should commit us. We should commit ourselves to our faithful creator. That's my point six. And finally, my point seven is that we continue to do good. Now, you might be thinking, you've given this talk and you said it had the title of living with an eschatological monocle. But you haven't even mentioned those words during this whole talk. Well, here's the reason. All seven of the points I've made are about living with an eschatological monocle. So an eschatological monocle, you know, they're like those old round eye piece things that people used to wear. If we have an eschatological monocle in our one eye, as we face life. The first thing we'll do is that we'll live the rest of our earthly lives for the will of God. We'll be sober and level-headed and suss out what's going on around us so that we pray powerfully and effectively. Above all, we'll love each other deeply, even the people that get up our nose. We will offer hospitality to each other without grumbling. If we have this monocle in our eyes, then we'll use the gifts that God has given each one of us. And every single one of us has a gift. We'll use it for the other believers around us. We'll commit ourselves to our faithful creator and we'll just relentlessly keep on doing good things as we have the opportunity. So what do I, um, what do I hope for? Well, can you imagine if our church, in our church, everybody lived the rest of their lives for the will of God? Can you imagine if everyone was sober and alert and prayed powerfully and effectively? Can you imagine if all of us loved each other deeply, covering over offenses and sins against each other? Can you imagine if every single one of us offered hospitality to each other without grumbling and that we used our gifts to serve each other faithfully not any one person saying i'm, I'm holding back I, i'm too you know i'm nobody but every person using their gifts can you imagine if every single one of us trusted unshakably in our creator god that he is sovereign, he's the creator, he sustains everything. And can you imagine if every single one of us just continued relentlessly to do good? What a church! I'd certainly, I'm saying, hey, I want to be part of that church. So what do I hope that you'll take away from today? Well, I'm hoping that you'll break with this, the God of this world and that you will uh, fix a, a an eschatological monocle in your eye and uh, that you will decide I'm following Jesus no matter what, no matter what comes my way, I'm done with the God of this world. That you will say I'm going to live the rest of my life for the will of God. That you're going to say to yourself that I am going to be alert to what's going on around me and I will be a prayer that you will go away from this and that you will say, 
I will love people deeply, even the people who have offended me, I will love them. That you're going to say, I'm going to invite people around to my garden, at least four of them, to my garden. Uh, and that you're going to say, I'm going to use the gifts that God has given me to serve other people. That you're going to say, you know what, no matter what, I'm trusting in my Creator God. And finally, that you're going to say, wherever I can see I can do good, I'm going to do it. I hope that's what you're going to take away. You know, most of us, and, and I'm certainly being realistic about me, I won't remember these seven points tomorrow. But I can, I'm going to remember this. And I think we're all clever enough to, when we think about living with an eschatological monocle, I think we're all clever enough to work out what that probably looks like in life. The way that we live for God and love each other and serve and, and do good, etc., etc. So I pray that God will stir something in you today for the sake of the kingdom, that you will live the rest of your days with an eschatological monocle in place. I wonder if I could pray. Father, thank you for your son who came and took upon himself all the punishment for every failing that we have ever made and ever will make. Lord, our hearts are so infinitely grateful to you. You have so won our hearts. You have so wooed us that, Lord, we want to have the attitude that Peter has written of here. And, and we want to behave in a way that makes your heart glow. Lord God, may we be a people of great joy and great delight to your heart. And may we know the joy and the fulfillment that comes from living that way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Sean, for your message. You've definitely given us food for thought. And if we remember nothing else from your talk, we will remember the eschatological monocle. Did I say that right? I think I did say I think that you right. Said it right. I should say that right. Um, so we hope. <laughs> you should we, say it right. Yeah, I should. We hope you've enjoyed today's meeting. Um, we wish you a great week, and we hope that you will log in again next Sunday. Absolutely. God bless. God bless, and to all those Liverpool fans out there, welcome to the club. Uh, the club of people who've won one Premier League, including Leicester City and Blackburn Rovers. You've joined an elite team. So well done, guys. Enjoy your week. God bless. Bye. <laughs> Bye.